This is Off Planet Radio. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the summer of 2020, the season of the witch here in America. Um, it is like a great black spell has been cast over the land. And it's not just here, but it is profoundly dark in the United States right now as this uh, celestial war, this witchcraft spell that's been dropped upon us continues to weave its illusions on people and people are stumbling bad, man. Um, hard, hard world out there right now. We have, um, we've just watched as people have fallen under the spell of what, what my guest is going to talk about the Illuminati. Um, it sounds now kind of cliche, but understand that, um, even whatever your belief system is, there is a structure of wickedness and evil that exists in this world. And they're making their play right now. That's what we've talked about on this show. I've talked about it in my Eye of the Needle series, that this is where we're at right now. We're in the eye of the storm. And so uh, it's important to in a lot of ways, revisit old information because this show's been talking about things like MK Ultra, the National Security State, uh, mind control operations, deep military and black operations for 10 years. And it's the gift that keeps on giving because these bastards don't go away. So uh, if you don't know, I'm Randy Moggins and uh, we're back. We're back here in the summer of 2020. This is... Um, sort of a relaunch of the show in a way, uh, having moved off of a platform and gone back to doing sort of a, a old school style off planet type TV and radio show. And I'm excited to be back. There's interesting things coming. If you want to know where to find the show, specifically the eye of the needle and any new off planet radio shows as well, it is patreon.com forward slash Randy Moggins. And uh, if you want to go over there, there are support levels for that as little as five bucks a month gets you the podcast, the Eye of the Needle series, and communiques from the, uh, the front desk, the war front of Off Planet Radio. And uh, so that's the catch up news. That's where we're at. And we're going to go really deep tonight into some interesting information that includes all kinds of supernatural, paranormal stuff, as well as. Um, a probe into the deep state. I want to introduce you to somebody I had the pleasure of meeting last year. And we did a show on his YouTube channel. He was kind enough to have me on. And we talked about MK Ultra. We talked about my background. And today, we're going to reverse the court. And I want to introduce you to my guest, Ian Thropos. Welcome, my brother. Thank you, Randy. Thank you for having me on the show. It's good to have you on. Um, you and I were kind of introduced by a third party named Christine Joanne Hart, who, uh, <clears throat> interestingly enough, contacted me and said, she sent me your video link and told me that uh, you had basically come out in my defense after this lunatic, Terry Joyce, had begun ripping me apart over this really old uh, web domain bullshit that's been floating around for it's been floating around since 2010 and trying to link me to money laundering pedophilia all kinds of nasty shit and you were kind enough to take up the banner for me and I saw that and uh, that began a conversation and really you introduced me to some interesting information so we're going to talk about your family background and, and specifically um, the shadows of your great uncle, the late congressman, right? Congressman George H. Mahon. Yes, the late 
congressional leader, um, uh, who is he, they, he, his title or whatever some people called him, he was the dean of Congress. Yeah. But these uh, world shakers and stuff like that, they just called him the chairman. He was the chairman. He was in his time the most powerful person on Capitol Hill. Uh, and a figure that a lot of people don't remember from that period. He served, what, like 40, 42, 44 years? I'm fixing to read a, ch uh, not a chapter, but a paragraph off of Naga Bauer's new book that came out about a year ago about my great uncle. And I found out some more information. You know, it's longer than that, as a matter of fact. He, he, ha he held the, he controlled every dime of the United States defense budget, and that's Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, for 40-something years. Jesus. I mean, that's, that's, an, that's something we don't really wrap our heads around now because of the way power has been reappropriated. Going back, I, and I looked at, because he has a Wikipedia entry, and I was pretty sure the number was 44 years, but we all know the wiki can be a little shaky sometimes with, with its information. So uh, just for the sake of the argument right now, we'll say he served yeah, over 40 years and 33 of those years, he was, he was the man. He was the go-to man for anybody that was anybody. Yes. As a matter of fact, the Manhattan project, um, it came down, it was so secretive. They kept giving this general money, kept giving them money, kept giving them money. And they finally just said, we're not going to give you any more money. And these were at record setting amounts of money. And, uh, he came and he said, look, we need the money. He said, one, we'll tell one person, we'll tell one, you know, human being. And they of course got together and decided that it would be my great uncle. And so they brought him in. He was like the fourth person to even to know what the Manhattan Project was about way before the president and everything, because they had to loosen up the money for it. And uh, he looked at all the information and he came back and uh, assured Congress that it was uh, being well spent. The money was. Now, your family's kind of out of Texas and very much part of what we would call a bloodline. I mean, uh, as I recall reading your book, let's let's. Let's tell people about the book that you wrote. Explain a little bit about that. And um, that's the source for this information as well. Okay, let's do that. Okay, so um, my book is called My Family Created the National Security State. And in parentheses, no need to thank me. <laughs> that is the name of my book. <laughs> And what I recall about that book was that um, you had the sense, even as a kid, that you were sort of into something that was maybe not normal, that wasn't part of, uh, let's say, the Ozzie and Harriet world of uh, 1960s America. Um, that's, that's correct. Um, your father was a real estate, real estate mogul. And um, so your uncle basically began his political career in, if I'm correct, the 1930s? Yes. FDR. He represented the 19th Congressional District of the United States Congress, and he helped form that district. And he ran unopposed all of those years. And before he quit being a congressman, a young upstart politician ran against him and lost. And this politician's name was George W. Bush. Of course it was. <laughs> yeah, there's your first, first nexus right he, there. I know it. And, uh, you know, the, the George Mahon Federal Building in Midland, Texas, they recently rechristened it and had a big uh, affair or something ceremony because that is now the George Mahon and George W. Bush Federal Court Building. It's named after two people now. Wow. Wow. Yeah. But the one in Lubbock is still called the George Mahon Federal Court Building. There's also a statue directed. That's in Lubbock as well, right? There's a statue of your uncle? There really is. Um, and that they show people when they visit the old dome building. And it's the only statue of a congressman that was made while the congressman was still alive, much less 
and in his case, still serving in the Congress. So it was quite unusual. And uh, I understand he, you know, didn't really want them to do it, but it was one of those deals where, you know. So this is a very, very high profile, beloved leader. Yes, he was, but he was very reserved. Mm -hmm. he, he, he didn't hardly say anything it didn't seem like, you know. Um, but there, there are, in the Southwest Collection at uh, Texas Tech, there are, uh, you can get online and listen to conversations that are taped between Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson and my great uncle. And mm -hmm. of course they knew that they were being taped for posterity. And mm -hmm. it's just so bizarre because Lyndon Johnson's first, he does all, he's doing all this stuff to try to get $800,000. And it's to, to build all that stuff out there at his ranch. You know, that kind of became a scandal, you know, that, that, pe that people know about. But at one point in the conversation, he's telling my great uncle, he's like, I'll do anything. I'll sign anything. Just, you know, give me the $825,000. I'm like, I can't believe the audacity of this guy, you know. Johnson, um, boy, what a, what a conflicted character in history Johnson is. Sitting where he did at the seat of power, stepping in after JFK was assassinated, um, which is an entire ball of wax. We did that. <laughs> We did that back in 2013 when we did the 50 year anniversary of JFK. And, you know, people who wind up in the center of power, it's not an accident. Um, it's not. The selection of people who, like your uncle, and the sense that I get from what I've read and from what you're communicating is that your uncle was very tight lipped that he was a man who was not only capable of, but required to hold a lot of secrets. And that in a lot of ways, that is the type of quiet power that really steers the ship of state. It's not, it's not the speeches that are made by the politicians. It's not the president getting up and addressing the nation. It is the quiet, dark men behind the lines of power that control our government. And from that standpoint, it was so interesting to see the material that you put out on your uncle because it delineates so well exactly how we got to where we are today with this now just massive, what uh, the late journalist Danny, Danny Castellano called the octopus, the multi-armed beast that has its, its tentacles wrapped around our throats. So Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that Randy, that I come from a family of pharaonic dominators, but I do want to stress, and I think it needs to be understood to try to get the whole understanding of the picture. I come from a family of dirt farmers from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Dirt farmers working every day, no, not, no, no money or anything like this, you know, and, but just a good work ethic, character, you know, meant a lot and just out there on the farm. And my, uh, my grandfather's, they had another brother, brother and he was a, a blacksmith. And then of course my grandfather was an attorney. Hey. So how does that fit into where your uncle wound up? It, again, this is so interesting when you look at how our government at one time was, was really was a government of the people in the sense that people move through the political ladder, moving out of, you know, little pockets of rep representatives and then moving into Congress where they then begin to gain a critical mass on their power. But yet at the same time, I think sometimes it's not useful for us to have the sense of the shadow government as being these overt ubermen so much as these are men who were tasked with jobs and their jobs happened to be running uh, what eventually became this, this deep state operation. So unfold a little bit about your, your family and what you remember about your uncle and however this, this plays in, because you have memories of your uncle when you, you were a kid, right? He died. When did he die? And um, I, I would say, now he died, after my grandfather, because my grandfather uh, had a, a um, maybe a, a small stroke or something, and he ended up running his car into a deal on the farm, and I think he might have died around 1972. And I would say that uh, Uncle George died between 1978 and probably 1981, somewhere okay. 
right around there. I think his okay. last year in Congress was 1976. Okay. And so he retired, and then and the guy who ran against him the time before that and lost ran and won. And of course, that's George W. Bush. Okay. And uh, my so my great uncle retired, and guess where he went to work? I might have told you this before. I don't remember. The, the board of directors for the Smithsonian. Smithsonian, that's it, of course. It yeah. doesn't get any better than that, does it? I mean, come no, on. No, and it's all converge over later on when you and I talk about uh, some of these more exotic subjects, including these, these um, elongated skulls and stuff. Yeah. Because the Smithsonian figures in prominently. <laughs> as the People think that's a museum. That's a museum in the sense that they're showing you the, the history they want you to see. Other than that, it's been uh, basically a way to remove a lot of the more hidden history of the United States and, and even the world. And there's, there's pictures out there of them. And it might even been you that pointed me to this of um, them removing these giant elongated skulls and, and taking them back. I mean, it's rumored that in the Smithsonian Institute, there are basements and sub-basements, which are uh, secured storage areas for artifacts that we're not allowed to see. That, yeah, and probably like the Indiana Jones movie, there's probably pe that people have just forgotten they're down there. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and, and we also know that they filled that up and they started just taking these skeletons of giants out to sea and just dumping them overboard into yeah. the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. So give us a little bit of your family background and some of your memories. I, I interrupted you with a little detour. Oh yeah. Uh, I, I just, uh, character was uh, something that was big, you know, um, and we, we come from uh, farmers. I, I grew up in Lubbock, Texas, and uh, my great uncle was a big deal there. And um, my, you know, kind of family was a big deal there. And uh, Lubbock is a town that, you know, back in the 70s had maybe 128,000 people. So it's what most people would consider a small town, but it was vastly larger than all the other little towns around there. So Lubbock was a hub of, you know, had Texas Tech University. And my other grandfather on the other, on my mom's side was the dean of uh, government, the government department at Texas Tech University. He was also heavily involved with the NCAA, and he was the president mm -hmm. of the NCAA for one year. And he is what is called the the father of the National Letter of Intent. And any of your viewers that follow college football know that there's this thing called a letter of intent, right. which the players sign, and it keeps them from just turning into just prostituting and getting cars all over the place, you know. And then go, and then they'll say, "Fuck you, we're going to go over here," you know. Yeah, it basically so. locks them down into. Uh, where they can be traded and it's, it's in a lot of ways it's almost like and I hate to be this crude but I look at the way they trade sports players and it's like a livestock auction absolutely yeah and and they ha they've known that those guys are getting hurt it's playing football is not good yeah. for the human being no you it's get, not no it's not making you smarter it's gladiator sports it's this is old roman shit um, yeah, it's not lost on me. I mean, I've enjoyed watching football. I'm not a big fan of it anymore, but it's not lost on me. The guys that I saw even in high school that got busted up bad playing football guys yeah. that, you know, now they're my age and they're limping around with knees that don't work and their bodies are uh, all bashed up from playing football. I, I will tell you this. My father was an outstanding athlete and he, me and my brother are really are good athletes, but not like my father. My father got a full football scholarship to the University of Texas. And so he was really quite an outstanding athlete, but his knee got hurt. And so, you know, he that ended his, you know, scholarship and everything like that. But growing up in the home, we played soccer, tennis, and stuff like this. Never in my entire life in childhood was it ever mentioned or brought up or even – anything about football like you know other kids may have been you know encouraged by their parents to play football or whatever now 
my, you know, I was pretty young when, when my, me and my brother are smaller than my dad, you know, and, and my dad was not just a huge guy, but my father was a lion of a man, but he was about 5'10", you know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm 5'8", so it mm-hmm. just, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't, I'm, I didn't want to play football and, uh, and they never brought it up. So in the shadows of George Mahon, what are your memories about your uncle and things that kind of looking back on it now indicate to you that, that there was something else going on there? Well, yeah, because it, I've, you know, been questioning, I became a truther or a conspiracy theorist at a alarmingly young age. I mean, I don't know if I was 11 years old or something like that, but I mean, just way before anybody else. And I had the whole closet full of books, but, uh, they used to tell me, they used to tell us in the family that you can't imagine how powerful your great uncle George is. You just, it's just not possible. And that kind of got turned around because I now realize it's the opposite. They didn't know my aunts, my uncles, my dad, my mom, they had no idea, but they're, they had, they were told little stories and stuff like that. that there's these meetings all over the world. I mean, you know, like the United Nations, but all more like balls and galas and stuff like that with mm-hmm. royalty and stuff like this. And so it's kind of like almost like a, uh, a ritual in that when the people, the prince of this and that comes in with his wife, they announce them at the door, you know, and everybody claps or whatever. Sure. Well, the protocol is you just ignore everyone and you walk all the way to the very, very back. And that's where my great uncle's sitting and you repay your respects to him. And then after you do that, it's party. We party. And then you can talk to anyone you want to. It, it, it sounds like a ritual, doesn't it? It does sound like a ritual, yeah, very much. Well, they're very ritualistic people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I'm wondering if, so when we talk about the national security state, and specifically the Manhattan Project, which was the first black project for all intents and purposes. Um, The history of that being that it precedes the National Security Act, which um, I don't know where you are on this, but I've studied the National Security Act. People have said that the National Security Act is many things, that it really consolidated America's assets after the war to enable us to operate more efficiently in terms of intelligence operations, military operations, and um, a certain level of um, cloaking of of the operations. Um, You know who Rich Dolan is? Richard Dolan? So Richard Dolan says that the NSA was started to basically keep undercover the UFO alien disclosure material that was going on. And to some degree, I would agree with all of those, but I will tell you what my studies have shown me about the National Security Act was that it was fundamentally a redefining of the structure of government in the United States. That's what you were saying earlier, Randy. You were talking about how it used to be a government for the people, and now it's just this big hydra, you know. Uh, and Yeah, and, and I was going to say, well, of course, Randy knows the year that that 1947, baby. 1947. Yeah. You know, the same year that uh, Kenneth Arnold had saw his uh, something that he described as a flying saucer, you know. All kinds of shit went on in 1947. The same year that uh, Jack Parsons and Ron L. Hubbard went to do a magic ritual Babylon awakening or whatever in the desert. Discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, it was an epic year. And, you know, honestly... We're in one of those periods right now. We are in, uh, that would have been an eye of the needle period, 1947, after the war. Um, It was, people don't understand that wars, and there's a famous quote out there, I wish I could remember who said it, that wars give us the opportunity to make social changes we couldn't possibly make in generations politically. Um, We're in a different kind of war now, obviously. World War II, and all the smaller wars like Korea, where my father fought, um, going right up to Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, and the operations that continued through the Obama administration. We're not in that period anymore. We're now in the final war, which is the psychic war and the war of the higher powers. 
And the epicenter of all of this is the deep state operations that were the very thing that your uncle was at present at birth. I mean, if you could say anything about George H. Mahon, he was sort of the midwife for creating this this deep state operation. You know, and, and some people have thought maybe I was going a little bit overboard saying that, you know, he created, you know, the CIA, he created the FBI, he created the NSA. Well, he was right there and he, he, he cut the check. Let me just put it like that. He's the one who wrote the check, you know, and it's, yeah, it, it took a whole many people to create these organizations. You know, it's some of my, the things I've said were a little bit sensational, but let me tell you, he, he was right in there, right in there with it. You know, I don't think you're being sensational at all. If you go back, to the time that the Manhattan Project was started, and I don't remember the exact year, but I'm thinking 41. Um, that was done under a complete cloak of secrecy because of the nature of the kind of weapon that they were going to create. What they discovered, and this, some of this is history, some of it's known, some of it is tales that have been told over the years, was that they discovered how powerful it was to be able to conduct business behind a fail of secrecy without accountability to congressional committees. Hence, enter George Mahan, the man who's holding the checkbook, the man who is the figure that everybody is going to. And in that period, this became the new way to do business. He really was sitting there on the edge of the berth of the national security state that was birthed in 1947. It must have been a rush, being sitting there at his perspective on in so many of these meetings and everything, just realizing, I mean, it must have been, uh, and, and uh, William Cooper, Bill, old Bill Cooper, you know, our friend that, that wrote the book, and you know, he, in his most famous book, Behold a Pale Horse, right. he accuses my great uncle of being the man, in that book, of being mm -hmm. the man who started the dumb bases, the deep underground military slash alien bases. Yeah. And in that book, he says it, that he knew. And then the guy who was writing, when he wrote the book knew and like none of the, the people in between didn't even know what it was. Bill Cooper is in some ways, the reason why I'm here. There's a couple of people that inspired me. Uh, Rod Serling, um, Bill Cooper, and um, the late, great Art Bell uh, were people that I looked up to and respected in terms of what they were doing, all of them with different degrees of fallacy in their accounting, you know, and certainly with Bill Cooper, you know, there are, I've listened to almost everything Bill Cooper ever broadcast. And there are times when I sat and listened to Bill Cooper that I got chills up my spine there were other times that I listened to Bill Cooper and I'm going, mm, just controlled opposition here. And, and some of that's just because of my own background, my inner knowing that says I can filter some of this stuff. But the totality of it is that, you know, what Bill Cooper wrote in that book, and specifically towards your uncle, you could look at that and say he was being vehement towards your uncle. He was disclosing a fact bearing in mind that Bill Cooper himself was inside of that same circuit board. And he himself was in some ways kind of a controlled opposition. Although I think he went off the script. Yeah. And, and, and he, and he didn't even have to know it, but he probably suspected it. But you know, uh, Bill Cooper was a member of the De Demo Lay Society. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the yeah, so. pre-order of the, the Freemasons. That's where you go in as a teenage male and you're recruited. And that's basically the gateway into going into Freemasonry. Right. And, and you know, I'm not a Freemason, but I, and I will tell you that I, I have not been to the lodge in over three years now because it's kind of it's a little bit of a, a falling out, but uh, many of your, your, some of your listeners know that I, I am a member of the uh, the OTO, which is a, a rather uh, as an mm -hmm. interesting reputation, and there's a lot of Freemasons in this organization, and uh, just the whole Templar thing is very weird. 
And, you know, you were talking about an organization that does not do any type of promoting whatsever, yet we're in there. And then you're, I'm thinking, what do I have in common with these people? It's like, oh, we were all 14 years old and had a closet full yeah. of Aleister Crowley books that we just spontaneously bought. And we were reading them and didn't understand a damn word. Yeah. You can start with that. Yeah. Why? Why were we doing this? Why were we doing it? It's like, my, you know, my, I was introduced to Edgar Casey through my father. It literally was reading Edgar Casey. That was my kind of my gateway into that. But my father was my my whole my whole paternal lineage were Freemasons, including my mother, who was in the Eastern Star. And um, I was approached. I've been. I was approached. I was told I would be approached three times and three times only to become a Freemason. And I declined all three times. I didn't, you know, and the truth of the matter is it wasn't anything other than I didn't feel like they had anything to offer me. I sort of had an inside view on a lot of this stuff. And I don't condemn Freemasonry per se. I don't condemn the OTO or people who are in other societies and organizations. There's a misdirect here in terms of... Uh, let's say displaced anger and trust. Uh, the lodges have been corrupt. The lodges were basically disempowered a long time ago for, to a large degree. They were, however, and this is according to my grandfather, who was 33 degree, um, where arch, what was the term? Arch, um, the, um, all of a sudden, the royal, I, the royal arch. Yeah, Freemasonry. So he told me that those were the gateways that people used to tap into connections, powers, networks. My grandfather by himself was not like your family, blue collar people. He made, he made his way up through the ranks of the Pennsylvania Railroad, and yet Did you say railroad, railroad. Pennsylvania Railroad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, big. Yeah, that's big. Yeah, huge I mean, that'll come up again in the Ghost Light Trail thing, railroad thing. Um, but he knew people in power. I found pictures of him sitting at a conference table during World War II with um, Give Him Hell, Harry Truman. With Harry what? Truman. Oh. Mm hmm. He knew the he knew the Speaker of the House of Representatives. He knew the he knew the congressmen and senators in the state of Pennsylvania. He knew political figures that made no sense for a man who lived the kind of life that he did. And I'm saying all this to kind of prime the pump a little bit with you, because again, people misunderstand how these things operate, uh, even how the free lot the, the Freemasonic lodges operate as well. That. Um, there's a lot of interplay between people who you would consider to be common and those who have reached higher levels of power. They have to, these organizations have to interpenetrate every level of society. Exactly. Yes, there are people that are in the Illuminati that are middle class, lower middle class, and in some uh, cases, uh, what we you know, consider poverty and everything. Being in the Illuminati does not mean that you have money. There is right. a level exactly. of uh, Yeah. You know, uh, and in fact, I, having done you know these shows for over ten years, I've I've interviewed a considerable amount of people who come from backgrounds like yours, and people who have been in in projects and programs like MK Ultra. Uh, some of them, like yourself, really come from common backgrounds. You know, people that were farm people, people that worked that's in gotta the dirt. Be almost, that's got to be most of the people, you know, because how can you control the masses unless you've got your people in the masses. Well, see, the other interesting thing about that is our perception in this technological society of how we view, view people who work the land. Um, not as common and downtrodden as you might think. My grandfather owned a, a considerably large farm. My paternal grand, my maternal grand, grandfather, they were farmers. They were far wealthier than the other side of the family that were 
uh, hobnobbing with the elites. And it's yet, just a hop, skip, and a jump away. It is. Sometimes so, it's less than that. You know, we, this is, unfortunately, we've lost the historical perspective on, on the people who worked with their hands and worked on the, on the land and not understood that that's a connection that's very deep and that they exploit that, they use that. Right. You know, there was some factoid that they had maybe 30 or or so years ago in the, that every, astonished everyone. And that is in the United States of America, your average millionaire drives a Ford pickup. You know, that it makes sense what you think about it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So what went on in, in the background of your family? Any stories where mm, spooky things, things that didn't line up, um, you know, secret handshakes, uh, stuff like that. Yeah. No, well, let me tell you, there's, uh, there was the time when we went to see Uncle George in Washington, D.C. And we were, this was in the 70s, and, and me and my little brother and my, and my mom and my dad, and we took the Capitol tour, and, and, the, and I found out that part of the tour, and, and this is, I guess, the sacred geometry aspect, but if you go today to the Capitol and take a Capitol tour, they'll be, and this isn't the old dome building, not where the Congress meets now, but where they met up until a certain time. And they do the tour and then they split the tour group in half. And the assistant goes over here with these people and, and go over here. Mm -hmm. And the people whisper, they whisper. And then the people who are in this group over here can hear every word they're saying, every word, but not, not vice versa. And they say, okay, this is where Congressman, uh, Con Congressman Mahon sat right here, you know, and they just showed us, um, statue and everything. So they, they still talk about him in there. And it's, it's just a big coincidence, you know, that just so happens that, you know, it's some really sacred jo uh, architecture. Yeah, it is. All kinds of sacred geometry going on in that place. And that's the, how they yeah. conduct power. I have wondered about mind control my entire life i've studied it and you hear these the horrendous things about this trauma-based mind control and so naturally i would ask myself oh my gosh because you don't think that you can have your memories erased and i think i wonder if i have been you know a victim of this trauma-based mind control and i will tell you right now that i i've never had a psychic until I had my Kundalini awakening about three and a half years ago and I've mm. had several psychics since then, but I have three main psychics and they do not know one another. And they have told me that yes, I am under some type of influence or quote unquote mind control, but no, I have not been through these horrendous programs like the uh, MK ultra type trauma based mind control. That and I don't know if they're right or, or, if, they're, or if they're wrong, but I, I, I get a sense that there's that there's some that was my intuition of you. I'll be very honest, and you actually answered a question that I was going to ask you if, in fact, you sense in some way that there was subtle mind control. And I have reasons why I asked that question because most of the people that I've talked to who come from families that have connections such as yours and it comes later in life, tend to have things that don't make sense in their memory stream. Um, and there's one person, he will be coming back on the show here in probably a month or so, whose father was, was actually part of the same system in a locale not far from where you are today, who was connected to NASA and some other operations as well. But he was basically what they call a utility man. He was a man that took care of what they call the small details. Um, Whitley Strieber was on this show years ago and talked about the fact that he had begun to discover in his memories as well these gaps that were being filled in. Now, Whitley has a whole lot of weird shit going on, but the story that he told was extremely parallel to what I've heard in terms of people who realize that they have disconnected memories, missing time, anomalous memories, and things in their family that when you start to put the dots together, as I started to do about 20 years ago, you go, that doesn't line up. Did I misremember that? In, 
it really does go into where you will start to second guess your own memories. And what I've learned in talking to people over the years and in my own practices is don't second guess yourself. Your first take on something is usually correct. And so I was going to ask you if you suspected that there was what we would call soft mind control. In other words, the type of thing where um, it's very subtle, almost subliminal, and it occurs uh, in a setting know. that's not necessarily so trauma-based. But remember, these people understand very well hypnotic, mesmeric techniques as well. I, I, I can provide you with that information, and, and you, you really hit, you know, old dirt with that because I have something an experience like this and um this is something that I've, it's you know I've heard it all and I've just never heard of this before it's very unique and unusual but I have I don't call it programming but I was when I was six years old I was given somehow is translated into my mind. It, I didn't hear a voice of God or anything like this, but I do actually remember when it happened because I remember the, the, the church and everything and being in the private school that I received somehow. And I'm not even saying that this is mind control. This could maybe be some type of divine plan. And if it is, then of course, maybe the cabal or whatever, or whoever would know about it and be wanting to mess with it. But I, it came into my mind, a plan very simple, because it's just a four stage plan for my life, starting when I'm an adult, mm -hmm. and very straightforward. And it goes like this. There's, there's four steps. It's like, nobody tell me, okay, this is what your life is going to be. It's more like a realization of me realizing, oh, this is what my life is going to be with a sure conviction that lasts to this very moment. There's never, the thought has never entered my mind that my life would not go down exactly like this. And the very first step of the four steps was prison. Go there. So I was six years old and knew that I would be going to prison. And I was terrified. And I never told anyone, I didn't tell my mother. And it was also through having this information, not really knowing whether I imagined it or what it, whatever it was, that that's what made me realize I really am different from the other kids. And uh, there was time, the kid, other kids liked me, but there was, uh, sometimes you do something, whatever, I mean, not fart or anything like that, but we're all social animals and everything. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when I did something, sometimes the kid or a kid or something like that would get a weird look in his eyes, like they were just like you know, a deer in their headlights. And I thought, wait, they're not liking me right now. And so I said, what did I just say that alienated me from this person? Because I want people to like me. And, and I, this is not what it was. But as, as a, a child, this is all I came up with. It, I came up with the idea that I was somehow smarter than the other children. And so I made a conscious decision to try to act not as smart because right, I wanted right. the children to like me. Right, exactly. And so there, the, the four-stage plan for my life, uh, okay, so number one, prison. <laughs> number two, and I sent you a chart if you, you know, want to put it up there or whatever, I, uh, of the uh, stuff I was sending you today. Um, right, I, I will. Step number two is, and, and this is what's so interesting about these steps. Okay, prison, that's not too hard to understand, but l literally, as simple as this is, it's, it, it's too sophisticated for a child that age to make up. I didn't, I did not imagine this. It was just, I was just. But this isn't your standard childhood, childhood fantasy at all. That's right. No. Uh, uh, there's, you know, there are people, there are some people who might say that I was raised with a silver spoon, you know, in, in regard, in comparison to like, you know, love it to, from, you know, far, uh, what do you call it? The, like where, Superman's from Plainsville or whatever. Oh yeah, but, uh, Smallville. And, and so that's true. But but yeah. I do want your listeners to know that I've lived most of most of my life. I've lived. Um, now I wouldn't say abject poverty, but I but definitely you know, almost uh, poverty and everything. And these and these are because of decisions that I made and things that I brought into my life. And uh, 
and, and I own that, you know, I lived poor almost my whole life because of the way I conducted my affairs, you know, and, and of course, partying and dope and all that stuff too. But anyway, the, the step number two that was given to me is that I was going to be in a biker gang, like, you know, Harleys mm-hmm. and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I have a Harley and I will tell you, I have never been in a biker gang. Okay. But I, and I've no, I don't think I've ever revealed it. I may have hinted around on some before, but I've never really told announced this and I'm really not announcing it now, but I, I, I well, yeah, I guess I am. I, I'm not going <laughs> to name the name, but uh, I, I am, or let's say I was because I've what they call laid it down, but I, I am a, um, a made member of one of the most, if not the most notorious prison gang on the face of the earth. Mm-hmm. And please, if you can guess what the, their name might be, please don't blurt it out. You know, I, I can say that I've got mad love for the brothers. You know, they're still my brothers, mm-hmm. you know, you know. And so uh, in my estimation, that fulfills that, um, you know, no, I was not in a, in a, uh, a biker gang, but yes, I was, and in a, in a way you're in it for life, whether you lay it down or not, a member of a prison gang. Exactly. Okay, that's step two. And that brings us basically to step three. And that's where I'm at right now, you know, halfway through the list. And this is another one that's maybe may, may a little bit hard to understand, maybe not. Um, I Step three is, or the way I understood it when I was a child, that I'm going to be a rock star. I mean, I always loved, wanted to be a rock star. <laughs> Or, you know, up yeah. rock band, all that stuff. And, I, and it was just so, it was just so great. And I, I, you know, I, I'm not, I don't really, I don't think that a man my age is going to become a rock star. I, you know, it, but let me tell you, there's a lot of things going on right now that we never would have thought would happen. But yeah. I yeah. think what's, what's going on is, is uh, you're in inter- right now, you're interfacing with a human being, a man who, in my opinion, is in the process of becoming famous. And as a matter of fact, in some small way or in some great way, you're helping me do this right now by mm-hmm. introducing me to your viewers. You know, you, you've got one of the most, you're one of the most well-known people on the truther movement, you know? And so thank you for having me thank on your you. show. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it, you know, and what is fame? You know, somebody's it's, some, one person's fame is not a, you know, it's all subjective. It's not fame. It actually is. Um, it's having a, a reputation, and that's something that I was raised to prize very much. So it may not be a large audience, but it's it's <clears throat> my audience is solid. The people that listen have been here for years. They've got and, loyalty. You know, loyalty I'm as for. good as the people that listen to me, and hold me accountable, which is important. But it's interesting that you're talking about this because first off, what is fame and and how do we achieve it? We know what the price of fame is in the mainstream. We know what Hollywood is like. We know what the rock music industry is like. I mean, I've been through parts of the music industry. I dabbled in it. And when I saw the dark side of it in 1979, I went, no. So um, never going to be a rock star in this life, but we're all rock stars in different ways. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And, and another like interesting side thing about that is that where I work, I'm a producer of music and EDM music and I have like the best gear and I, I went to college for this and I've been working at laborious and I work for five hours a day on my music and I have, Come up, I've got some number one hits right now. And we're, we're, I'm working with a guy who's my mentor in college, and he happens to be one of the biggest producers in the nation, but not of music per se, but of television commercials. Okay. And so we're actually uh, pursuing a lady. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You do not want to despise the royalties that come from music that lands on TV commercials. Those mechanicals are very lucrative. And um, ask, you know, this is, this is why now, you know, it's so prized. I mean, for years, the Beatles didn't license any of their music. 
And then I guess in recent years, the estates have discovered, mm, boy, there's some real money here. So they've yeah. kind of allowed that to go out. But um, uh, EDM itself is very interesting. Boy, that's a whole separate subject that we could we could do. And maybe with your permission, what we'll do, if uh, if I can, is we'll take a piece of your music and we'll use it when we bump her out yeah, of the that's show. That's a great idea, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. We'll bump her out with that. Okay, um, the EDM industry right now is it's a completely different model than than what we had with rock and roll because of the way charts work and because of the way music is created licensed produced i'm never sure anymore whether someone's a producer a dj an artist or if they're just all three and and all the lines have become blurred now because producers and djs and writers and this comes out of uh, hip hop culture as well. You, there's so many people that are working to bring this music forward. It's a completely different model than what we had. The old model, which was rock and roll through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, was really based on the old music publishing business, whereas this is much more built around dance music and the hip hop culture, which is basically freestyle, just creating beats and creating all kinds of beds. And that's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. You know, I think the difference is it's interesting because producers and DJs use the same equipment kind of, but DJs use desks and decks and stuff like that. And producers are more of the doll, you know, the, the computer based and it's, sure. yeah, it's all yeah. mixed up yeah. now. Yeah, and, I play around with some of this stuff. I had a few synthesizers sitting here, some drum machines. I mean, I play guitar. Actually, I played guitar, bass, and keyboards at different times, but um, I really like playing around with beats and loops and uh, just for fun. Theater. Yeah. Arpeggiators, yeah. Absolutely. Samplers, um, pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, you know, I another just kind of weird coincidence or whatever i started talking to this person i'm kind of wanting to project myself into her career but she's kind of a celebrity and kind of not you may have heard of this person but i really i don't really mind mentioning her name because there's it's not like gonna come out or anything but um her name is uh, she's a brilliant vocalist and her name is Haley myers okay do you know no, who i'm she not is? familiar you don't know who she is. No, you know who, uh, well, and I really shouldn't. Uh, okay. Well, you know who James Caswell is. Yes. This is, this is the mother of his child. Okay. All right. And we, we are only friends and I've never met her in person. You know, our only things we talk about is music, but she's an amazing um, vocalist. And it's just, it's weird how small the world is, you know? Yeah, it is small. Wow. That's uh geez, James Caswell. Um, that's a whole different different subject matter as well, talking about, you know, people like James Casbolt. But, um, or even Duncan Opinion. That would be Duncan? awesome. Yeah. So, and I, I, he's a hell of a guy, man. I, I, I like the hell out of him. Yeah. Um, these are people that, uh, you know, like them, don't like them. They're difficult personalities, but they put their story out there in the public record. And a lot of things that Caswell said that I was like, <clears throat> I, I sometimes just went, oh, Lord, I wouldn't be hurt saying that. But again, you know, it, like when we were talking about the lodges earlier, we have to be a little bit more discerning about how we spin people inside of these organizations, even like your own family and your uncle, George Mahon. Um, they serve a purpose and we can call them dark. We can say they're evil. I don't think anybody's totally evil. Yeah. I, I don't do that. I would, I, you know, I've had my, I just don't know. I don't know, you know, but I don't want to think that he was, but I mean, nobody does. Um, it's, it's, it gets beyond, you know, it's almost like one of these zero suit deals, you know, it's like beyond, I mean, I know nobody's beyond good and evil, but guys, it gets convoluted up there. I'm sure. The, the it's levels. very convoluted ultimately you have to filter through this with a bit more dispassion and understand that um when somebody comes to you and gives you a story like 
Duncan presented, like James Casbold, like, you know, dozens of people that I've talked to over the years. Um, first off, they're bringing a story to us that is specific to them, part of their experience. And what we glean from all of that has to do with how we're able to listen and encompass their experience and understand it and learn from it. Like the point of the show is always to point people back to the inner path, you know, but we also are not going to sit here and, and put the blinders on about the world around us. Mm -hmm. I'm, pissed off. I'm pissed off right now about this COVID bullshit. I'm pissed off about all kinds of stuff that's going on. I'm still pissed off about some things in my childhood. And truthfully, you know, whatever level of trauma, we've all been traumatized. You used the word in the book. And when you were talking about those, those four things, the four things in your life, the term that you used was imprinted. Do you remember that? That's an interesting way to look at it. Because an imprint is basically something that you're not fully aware of it, but it sits there. It's part of, you would call it programming. Yes. It, for instance, it, at any time in your life, if you've seen The Wizard of Oz, you've been imprinted. Programming. Yeah. For sure. Purposely yeah. imprinted. And if you've seen The Wizard of Oz played to the dark side of the moon, you've taken it to a whole other level. Yeah. <laughs> Probably taken acid at some point in your life. Exactly. Which brings me to, you You know, we'll talk about this and we, we bump over into the second segment because I know you had an experience with a shaman and some ayahuasca and I'd like to ask you about that as well. Um, we're kind of bumping up on the first hour. This went really fast. Is there anything we didn't cover that you want to cover in this hour? Anything you want to put out? And then obviously let people know where they can reach you, find you, and access your various enterprises well you bet you know i've got a website called uh, you don't know io and then i've also got a youtube channel called you don't know and that's uh youtube.com forward slash c forward slash you don't know okay and but i was just in closing about george mahon uh, just a couple little things there's I don't want to get into these different experiences, but there's been some kind of seems like maybe imprinting times in my life that had to do with a, a blight, a bright flashing light. And mm -hmm. I can tell you what these times were and when they were, and there, there were some weird things going on around them. But when we did go to the Capitol, one thing that anyone can do, if you're the constituent of a Congress person, you can go in there and have your picture taken with your Congressman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that usually goes, but it just so happens we were separated from our parents and it was me and my brother and we were told to come, we were ushered in here into the, the outer office of Jordan Mahon. And then, so here we are. And then here comes the photographer, the staff photographer for the Congressman. And then here comes our uncle George and he's a very tall man. And we were, you know, six or seven years old or something like that. So what they did is they, and we were wearing suits, our little 70s suits. And so they put us up on the desk and so he's next to us, you know, because we're standing on his desk. And we took a bunch, some pictures and stuff. But at, at some point, I got brave. And what I did is, well, let me just tell you like this. I, a couple weeks after the photos deal, this was back when they developed film and stuff like that. My mom came to me. She said, oh, you're in so much trouble. You're in so much trouble. I said, what? You know, acting like I didn't know what it was. And she, she wouldn't tell me what it was. But when your dad gets home. And I think I didn't actually get in trouble for that one, but they got all the pictures back. And in one of the pictures, we're sitting there with George Mahon, you know, and everything like this, and I'm holding up the peace sign. You know, I've seen it on TV, you know, the, 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 the hippie sign, peace. This you know, 1967, is that what you, when was this? When was what? this? When was this? Was this in like no, the 70s? No, no, 76. I, I was, 76. You know, okay. It was probably 74. See, I, I went dyslexic 40. on the numbers there. What what is what does that mean? This, yeah, peace sign. Okay, yeah, right. But or you know, if you're a Winston Churchill, it means victory. Right, right victory, whatever. yeah. But it's also well, another thing is it's the Roman numeral five, okay. and so this is, this is an Illuminati uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. reading gesture or whatever. And so I did think you know years later after I learned these things, I was like, wow, I naturally 
put up, you know, the Illuminati sign while I'm there with my great uncle. That was kind of <laughs> weird, you know. Interesting. Interesting. And, and the, one more thing. Yeah, Let me yeah. just tell you this, that, that I learned about his career and stuff like this since the last time I talked to you. He was so reserved and didn't talk and stuff like that. They've kind of let this out since then. But there was a time, uh, and it kind of got used as a photo op, that he kind of went ballistic. And what it was is he kind of told off Congress. And there's even some pictures that you couldn't get on the Internet before, but you can get them now. And he's just like, you know, like that. And you can tell it really is a, a photo op. He really was mad. But then they said, hey, let's turn this into a photo op. But what it was, he was chastising Congress for having loose lips. Loose lips sink ships. Mm. And he and he that was the only time he ever, uh, you know, got mad or, you know, didn't wasn't just totally cool. And they turned it into a little campaign, you know, and it just and it had a picture where he just, you know, <laughs> just a, you know, it was a photo op. OK, we're in trouble. You know, we're, we're the congressman. We we. Loose lips, sink ships. You, know. you broke the reserves of the uh, dignified elites. So uh, that's going to wrap it up for the um, public side of this, which will go out on YouTube. And um, all, of the, all of the contact information, Ian, for your stuff, sits down there on a little video bar. And don't forget to look down in the show notes because we always put show notes up because we're very much about the written word. Um, again, if you'd like to join support, um, get the inside skinny off, uh, it is uh, patreon.com forward slash Randy Moggins, my name, and that will get you the podcast, the extended edition, which we're going to go over into now. We're going to talk about, well, we're going to talk about these mysterious lights and orbs on the ghost light road in East Texas. It's going to get spooky. We'll do oh, that all. you talk about that, are you, Randy? What's that? Oh. You're not going to make me talk about Ghost Light Road, are you? <laughs> oh, God. Just a little. Just a little, brother. Just a little. Just like sands through the hourglass. There you go. So that's, uh, the that's, the second, that's the second segment of Off Planet Radio. The world turns. There you go. This is Off Planet Radio.